ideas do not fall out of thin air. Good ideas grow on trees. Welcome to our week eight dendrology lab at Stephen F. Austin State University. I'm Jeremy Stovall, professor of silviculture, and I'm recording this on March 14th, 2020, in response to the coronavirus outbreak and the fact that we need to move what's usually a lab held at Moroni Park in Nacogdoches, Texas, online. In this week's lab, we'll learn 12 new species. Many of them are vines, three are trees. Uh, all but two of these species are native to East Texas. The two that are not are English ivy, which is somewhat invasive, and kudzu, which is very invasive in parts of the south. Uh, you can see the 12 species here. Again, all but three are vines. Our first tree is box elder. Uh, despite its common name, box elder is a maple, Aceraceae, Acer nagundo. And box elder is kind of an odd maple. Uh, most of our other maples in the United States have a simple leaf. Box elder has a compound leaf. Most of our other maples in the U.S. are monoecious, meaning the trees are both male and female. Uh, whereas with box elder, it's a dioecious species. The male and female trees are separate. And compared to the other maples, box elder is a little bit less tolerant of shade. It's still shade tolerant, but not as much as the other maples. When you look at the leaves of box elder, uh, they are either trifoliate or sometimes they'll have five or seven leaflets. But the thing you really have to be aware of is when they're trifoliate, these box elder leaves can look very similar to poison ivy. If you've pulled these leaves off the tree, you may really have a hard time telling that they're not, in fact, poison ivy leaves. You have to be careful about that. When we look at this box elder leaf here, you can see if you took those bottom two leaflets and you moved them up so that they overlap the terminal leaflet, what you would have is a three-lobed leaf that looked a whole lot like a red maple. So you can kind of put the compound leaflets back together and see how it is similar to the other maples. As you can see here, we have uh, some of the other forms of leaves where you've got two that are trifoliate here, one that has five leaflets. Those are both pretty common. Rarely you'll also run into uh, maple leaves on box elder that have seven leaflets. Uh, the leaves are all uh, you know normal tree-colored green, and they're shiny on top. You won't notice much hair or anything on box elder leaves. When we look at the twigs, they're a great ID feature on box elder because they're stout twigs to hold that compound leaf compared to the other maples. They're opposite, like all our maples, and the most notable feature on them is that they are green. And that green twig, sometimes purplish in winter, but usually green, shiny, smooth, makes this a very easy twig to identify. One more trick you can use on the twigs when you point the tip of the twig at the ground, so it's upside down, as I've done in this photo here, you'll notice right in the middle of the picture there appears to be the letter V. What's going on there, you have opposite leaves, and the leaf scars almost connect, uh, forming that sort of V shape if you look on the side of the twig, where you have the buds to the right and the left. So green twigs, V-shaped leaf scars on the side of the twig, both excellent identification features. Unlike the other maples that we'll see, red maple and Florida maple in the U.S. South, box elder gets huge clusters of Samaras. Again, only on the female trees. The male trees won't have any Samaras. Uh, they're about the same size as the other maples. They'll go a light tan color. Here they're pictured green in about May in East Texas. They'll go a light tan color. And once they do, it looks like someone's taken like plastic tan grocery bags from Kroger and stuck them up on a tree. It looks like there's garbage stuck up in the tree, and that can make identification pretty easy. In terms of the bark, here's a small stem about an inch in diameter, and what you'll notice is the twigs are green. On the small limbs, they're green also. Uh, it's photosynthetic. There's chlorophyll in there, but it's a great ID feature. When they get larger, what you'll notice is that the bark is going to be rougher a little bit than the other maples, but generally light in color, like you see on this tree here, uh, that's about, I don't know, 15, 16 inches in diameter. Uh, the final thing we'll talk about with uh, box elder is the form. And when you look at the form of box elder, this, this picture is showing you a pretty nicely formed box elder. Sometimes when they're open grown, they tend to have good form. 
But often where you'll see them is kind of growing where invasive species would, would grow. I don't want to cause any confusion. Box elder is native. It's not invasive. But it, it'll grow in roadside ditches, disturbed areas, uh, edges, tends to lean out. So it tends to have poor form uh, for a maple. You're not going to get a ton of uses for timber or anything like that from box elder. Uh, its seeds are wind dispersed, so probably the not the most productive tree from a wildlife perspective. Uh, but it is a common native species all across the U.S. South. English ivy was introduced into the United States in the 1700s by European settlers. Its scientific name is Aureliaceae hedera helix. And English ivy is invasive. However, you typically only see it spreading in the area where it was planted. You don't typically see new colonies forming via seed dispersal. So in areas where people have planted it uh, as an ornamental because they like its appearance, it can really overtake all the vegetation and structures in an area. But outside of that, you typically don't see this as too bad of an invasive pest in the southern United States. Uh, th this vine grows all over the eastern U.S. and parts of the western U.S., so it is very widespread. Uh, beyond growing on structures, English ivy will grow on vegetation, uh, as you see here with it growing on a tree. It can, over top, uh, end up shading out the vegetation it's growing on, even large trees, and kill them gradually through shading. Uh, so you would want to be careful if it got on a tree in your yard or something like that, uh, where you need to knock it back before it overtakes the whole canopy. Uh, here's an example of it growing along the ground. It'll cover the ground, so people like it for garden beds. Uh, areas such as that. In terms of identification, you're not going to have any trouble at all with English ivy. Uh, here's a picture of the leaf. Uh, the lobing is variable. This, this leaf has five lobes with distinct uh, palmate venation. Other leaves uh, will sometimes be unlobed, three lobes. There's a lot of variability there. But it's an evergreen leaf. You always have it. Uh, it's a waxy, thick leaf, and the venation is usually a notably lighter color. So this is an obvious, just look at it sort of species. The leaves are obvious, and it's going to be growing all over the place wherever it's been established. So uh, probably best if you don't buy this and plant it in your yard, but you're probably going to see a lot of it in urban and suburban areas anywhere in the United States. Kudzu is an invasive exotic vine commonly found across the U.S. South, uh, but also sometimes further north. It's in the bean family. Its scientific name is Fabaceae puraria montana. Kudzu was brought into the United States in the late uh, 1800s, and it was planted to provide shade for porches, planted as an ornamental, became fairly popular. But what really led to its spread was a number of different government agencies, including the Civilian Conservation Corps, planting it in the 1930s primarily for erosion control. Well, it did a really good job of erosion control, as you can see in this photo here, and became a terrible invasive pest, where it now literally covers millions of acres across the southern U.S. Often the easiest way to identify kudzu is to just look at a vine that has really completely dominated an entire forest ecosystem, hillside, parking lot, or just anywhere where it's going to grow with this aggressive form. Kudzu can grow a foot in length a day with the shoots, and the shoots will twine or wind their way up things to grow in height. Now, they can only go around things about four inches in diameter or smaller, but that really doesn't stop them. They'll climb other vines. They'll climb small trees into limbs of large trees. They eventually cover an entire mature forest, shade it out, and as the trees gradually die and fall to the ground, they eventually convert an entire forest ecosystem into nothing more than a pasture of kudzu. Now, as they're doing this, many people describe what you see here as kudzu sculptures. Uh, so, for example, in the foreground here, a little bit to the right of center in this photo, I'm seeing what appears to be a kudzu bear. And up over the bear's right shoulder behind it a little bit appears to be a very large stalk of kudzu broccoli. Way in the background over the bear's left shoulder, there appears to be some sort of uh, Elon Musk X kudzu rocket ship. And to the left of that is a pretty clear-cut example of kudzu Stonehenge. Now, as we look at another picture of kudzu form here, 
Uh, I think it's uh, pretty inarguable here that you have a kudzu giraffe that's about to get quite the shock. And finally, in East Texas, here's what more typical form looks like, uh, where we can often expect kudzu to be a little less aggressive than other parts of the South, like Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, where kudzu is a real invasive pest. So uh, this is in Nagadocious County behind O'Reilly Auto Parts, and it's taken over a small hillside but never really made it up into the forest. This photo was taken later in the growing season. Kudzu is a deciduous vine, so all the photos we've looked at so far during the growing season, um, it, it'll basically tan or brown up outside of the growing season as it loses its leaves, but it springs right back the next year. You may have, you know, one of these vines with its tuberous root system, you know, growing in every square foot over vast acreages of land. Beyond its form, which is by far the best way to identify kudzu, its leaves are going to be helpful. It does look similar to many leaves in the Fabaceae family. It's trifoliate. They, you have wavy lobing on the leaf margins, especially on the basal two leaflets. And what you'll notice in this photo is that while the basal two leaflets are in one plane, the terminal leaflet is sort of folded up at 90 degrees from those two leaflets. So that kind of gives it a, a little bit of a distinct look. Uh, one reason it was planted as an ornamental was the showy and attractive uh, flowers that smelled very good. People like these. Uh, you can see it here, very purple, some yellows, some blues in there. Uh, so it will flower very prettily. And then finally on kudzu, it is in the legume family, the Fabaceae. So it has legumes, and here are examples of several kudzu legumes. So uh, if you have kudzu, good luck getting rid of it. It's going to take you five to ten years of repeated herbicide applications, mechanical removal, lots of time, lots of money, lots of effort, uh, and hopefully no one is planting kudzu anymore because it is one of the worst invasive pests in the southern United States. Hello, I am Bonnie Stovall, and today I am here to talk to you about tree art. This is a branch. It is made of metal, not wood. It has metal leaves in gold and silver. There are many branches and it hangs on the wall. These are squares, or when turned sideways, diamond-shaped, leafy things. Some of them have berries, some of them do not. They are reminiscent of leaves and are all slightly different. They too hang on a wall. Thank you. Black oak is an oak in the red oak group. Its scientific name is Fagaceae quercus velutina. And like many of the red oaks, it can be very large, 100 feet tall, can live in excess of 200 years. And black oak is really widespread over the eastern United States. It ranges from East Texas to the Atlantic Ocean, north up to the lake states in New England. However, in East Texas, it's relatively uncommon. And the important thing to know about black oak is that it looks very similar to southern red oak. But in East Texas, we probably have, you know, 99 southern red oaks for every black oak you might find. So you really need to prove to yourself that it's a black oak before you identify a tree in East Texas as a black oak. The best way to tell that you have a black oak is to start noticing very large shade leaves like you see here. Uh, these shade leaves could be the size of a piece of copier paper, you know, eight and a half by 11 inches. They can be absolutely enormous with very shallow lobing. When you look at the sun leaves higher up in the tree, you can see them as the dead leaves on the left in this photo. They look much more similar to southern red oak, Quercus falcata, where they're smaller, uh, the lobing is deeply incised, whereas the shade leaves on the right, which are live in this picture, again, large, very shallowly lobed. So that starts to tip you off that, hey, maybe we've got a black oak and not the southern red oak here. Next up, you want to try and find an acorn, if at all possible. And compared to southern red oak, these acorns have very tan, prominent scales on the cap of the nut. Um, and the cap on the acorn will cover more of the nut than we tend to see in southern red oak. 
When we look at the buds, remember bud scales and the involucra of bracts that forms the acorn cap come from the same basic tissues, and so they look similar. So the bud scales here are tan. The buds on black oak will be noticeably much larger than many of the other red oak group oaks. And while all oak buds are generally five-sided, uh, when you look right at the point of the bud down at it, you'll notice it's a, a pentagon. Uh, the buds on black oak are very obviously five-sided. So look for large buds, look for that acorn with the tan scales, look for the large shade leaves, and you can be pretty confident that you probably have a black oak. The next thing you can look for is the bark. You can see this tree is about 16 inches in diameter, and it's going to have rough dark bark, but that's not going to be that different from southern red oak. But there is one trick that you can use to confirm for yourself that you have a southern red oak. So what you want to do is take your knife out and you want to get in between the ridges and core a little bit into the tree. And what you're trying to remove is a little pinch of the inner bark of the tree. So basically it's going to be the phloem. And you'll notice that it's orange or red. Don't use the color of the inner bark to try and identify a black oak because pretty much every oak in the red oak group is going to have orange or reddish inner bark. So don't use that. The trick is you take this inner bark, you stick it down in your lip like a pinch of dip, and you leave it there for a minute. And it's going to taste really tart, really astringent. It's going to dry your mouth out. It's going to be kind of sour. And what you want to do then is remove it from your mouth and throw it away. And what you can do then is spit and you'll notice that your saliva has actually been dyed yellow by that bark you held in your mouth. The, the inner bark on black oak is loaded with tannins to a much greater extent than comparable other red oaks like southern red oak. And so the fact that your saliva is yellow is the distinguishing feature. If you tried this with southern red oak, it would still be astringent. It still wouldn't taste good, but it doesn't have enough tannins in there that it's going to dye your saliva yellow. Like all oaks, black oak has high wildlife value. It's a good mass producer. Its timber is high quality. It's used for furniture and flooring, sold right alongside species like northern red oak. Although black oak you typically don't see planted very often as an urban tree like you might with northern red oak, pin oak, or some other oaks that share a similar range. Evening trumpet flower is a native vine common across much of the southern United States. It ranges from East Texas over to the Atlantic Ocean and as far north as Arkansas or Virginia. If you're familiar with yellow jessamine, that's the same species. It's another common name for it. The scientific name for evening trumpet flower is Lagoniaceae gelsimium sempervirens. In terms of identification, when evening trumpet flower flowers right around mid-March in East Texas, you'll notice that it's all over the woods and is far more common than you probably thought. You notice these yellow tubular flowers, they're very showy, and it's very easy to identify during that time of the year, roughly March. Outside of the period when it's flowering, the most common mistake we'll see is people confusing evening trumpet flower with Japanese honeysuckle. They're both vines, they both have reddish stems, they both have opposite simple leaves. So it's an easy mistake to make. However, there are a few key differences. When you look at the leaves of evening trumpet flower, they're shiny, they're not furry. There's no tomentum or fuzz on them. That's a good distinction between evening trumpet flower and Japanese honeysuckle. Another key distinction is the long pointed acuminate tip on the apices of these leaves, whereas Japanese honeysuckle is going to have a much more rounded tip. Japanese honeysuckle also generally has a wider leaf than evening trumpet flower. So those are all good differences on the leaves. On the stem, they both have reddish stems when they're small. Uh, so the actively growing and twining uh, lead shoot of, of the stem. However, Japanese honeysuckle, the stem will have fuzz and tomentum, pretty dense covering it. Whereas evening trumpet flower, the red stem is glabrous, meaning it's smooth, it doesn't have any fur on it. So that's another good distinction. The fruits on evening trumpet flower are capsules. You see here what they look like in about May or June. 
uh, when they're green still, they haven't dried out or opened or released the seed yet. And you can see on the horizontal uh, axis here the line where the capsule is going to open. When they first open, they kind of look like Pac-Man where you can open them and it's sort of a half circle. So that's a helpful ID feature. Later in the year, in the late summer or fall, they'll dry out and they open along that line and then they also open on two other lines you can see um, on the, the far edges there. So the capsules are a distinct feature as well. In general, evening trumpet flower is going to be a pretty easy vine to identify. Evening trumpet flower is a very popular native ornamental. Uh, it's sold in the nursery trade. You can plant this uh, in gardens as a ground cover. Um, I've seen it growing on people's mailboxes as an attractive cover. It's got the evergreen leaves, so it'll be there year-round. And it works pretty much anywhere zone 6 or south in terms of the USDA plant hardiness zones. One key thing you do need to be aware of with evening trumpet flower is that all parts of the plants are poisonous. So this is a good ornamental, uh, but not something that you should be eating. Alabama Supplejack is a native vine across the southern U.S. from East Texas over to Florida and northward to Missouri, Virginia. Its scientific name is Ramnaceae burkemia scandens. Some folks also call this vine ratten vine, referring to its use, among other species, in wicker furniture. Alabama supplejack is generally pretty easy to identify based on its stems. It can reach two or three inches in diameter, and they're generally a drab olive green color with whitish stripes on them. Alabama supplejack grows by twining, which means it wraps around other vines, even itself sometimes, small trees, and even large trees. You can kind of think of this vine as a python or an anaconda or something like that. The way it grows makes it look like a snake choking out its prey. Sometimes, while it may grow on another vine, it'll eventually girdle it, kill it, and once that vine dies, it'll hang freely, as seen here, like a grapevine or other vine that more similarly hangs like this. The leaves are also very easy to identify. They're small, about the size of two quarters, they're very oval shaped and they have very parallel yet curving veins that lead out to a wavy margin. Uh, they're about the most oval shaped leaf uh, we'll see on any species this semester. When you flip over to the back of the leaves, they're much lighter colored on the back. So Alabama supplejack is an easy vine to identify. The leaves are easy. Uh, the vine itself is easy. So look for that twining, snake-like, olive green vine. Hello, I am still Bonnie Stovall, here to talk to you about more tree art. And I promise you, I am not doing this under duress. This is a metal tree surrounded by wood. It hangs on the wall. It would make more sense to have the tree in wood and the circle metal but alas, the artist didn't think of that. This hangs between wall sconces to make it look fancier. It would look even fancier if the sconces were gold. Thank you for tuning in. We're learning greenbriars as a group since all the species have similar ecology and similar wildlife value. The scientific name for greenbriars is Smilacaceae smilax with various different specific epithets. Greenbriars are native, high-climbing vines in the southern United States. They can very aggressively take over open areas like a clear cut, but you can also find them at ground level or even growing high in the trees in a forest with an intact canopy. Greenbriars are generally very easy to identify. They are evergreen, so you'll always have leaves. Some of the species like round leaf greenbriar, Smilax rotundifolia, or cat greenbriar, Smilax glauca, as seen here, have very wide, waxy, thick evergreen leaves. On the back of some of the leaves, like Smilax glauca, they will have a thick white coating of wax, often called a glaucus bloom. If you ever find one of these leaves, you can actually just rub the back of the leaf with your thumb. The wax will come right off and it'll be green, just like any other leaf. 
Some of the species have narrower leaves, like this lance leaf greenbrier seen here, Smilax smallii. We also have species like Smilax laurifolia, laurel leaf greenbrier, that are relatively narrow leaved. On many of the species, the leaves will become mottled on some individuals, not on others. Uh, so don't expect to use that as a feature which will help you tell species apart, but it is a good feature for our green briars. What you probably most know green briars for, though, if you've spent much time in the woods, is the nasty, sharp, pointy, recurved prickles. As you walk through the woods, these typically catch you about shin height, shoulder height, and once you walk into these, you can't just keep walking and kick through it. They hang on tight. It's a tough bind. You're not going to rip through them. So usually you have to disentangle yourself from the prickles and find a way over through around the bind. Uh, but they're very difficult to just break through. So it makes getting through the woods a little bit tough. makes identification easy. This stem may be a quarter inch in diameter, which is going to be fairly typical. Here's another stem. Often what will happen, the stems will start green. Then they will get larger and go woodier and become a tan color. About the biggest I've seen them in diameter is about three quarters of an inch. So they do remain a smaller vine, unlike Alabama Supplejack or some of the grapevines we'll learn here in a few minutes. Another thing that you can see in terms of identification in this photo is that the greenbriars grow using tendrils. Tendrils are modified leaves that wrap around things and hang on. So tendrils can be found wrapping around other vines, twigs, leaves, anything that the vine can use to grow taller. On all the green briars, the, the fruits are going to be droops. So here you see some examples of the droops. Uh, many of them will have a white glaucus bloom, that white wax we talked about on the leaves on some species. Many species will have that on the droops as well. And this is where the wildlife value of green briar comes in. Many different wildlife species will consume this as a soft mass. So green briars are native. They're kind of a pain to work around in the woods because of those prickles, but you see them on just about all our sites in the U.S. South. Slippery elm is one of our native elms. It's actually native to central Texas as well as east Texas, but its range extends far north into Minnesota and east all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, so very broadly distributed elm. Its scientific name is Olmaceae ulmus rubra, where rubra, of course, means red, and red elm is another common name for slippery elm. In terms of identification, slippery elm is going to look extremely similar to American elm. Uh, the bark uh, will be very similar. We'll go over a few slight differences with the leaves and the twigs. When you look at the leaves of a slippery elm, they have all the classic elm features. The base of the leaf is in equilateral, meaning it's lopsided. One side of the midrib will be bigger than the other. It has the classic doubly serrated margins or edges of the leaf. They have a nice acuminate tip. The diagnostic feature between slippery elm and American elm is that slippery elm will have a scabrous or sandpapery surface on both the top and the bottom of the leaf. Here you see the bottom of the leaf with that sandpapery texture to it. You might be able to make it out, might not. But if you feel it, you'll really feel it. American elm will have sandpapery texture sometimes on the top of the leaf, but rarely, if ever, on the bottom. And it's going to be very, very scabrous on slippery elm. It's going to be a very rough leaf. So that's your best leaf ID feature. Compared to winged elm, both American elm and slippery elm have leaves that are about twice as wide at the same length. Now, when you look at the twigs, it's going to have a lot of similar features to the other elms, where it's got the zigzag twig due to the indeterminate growth pattern. The distinction here is that these twigs are relatively fuzzy, so they've got some tomentum on them, but the color is an excellent feature, and this twig really is showing it well, where the color of the twig itself will be very gray, and the buds will be very black in color. Now, American elm tends to have a tan twig with tan buds, and winged elm, of course, often has wings on it, but even when winged elm is unwinged, it will have tan coloration throughout. In American elm, there may be some black coloration on the bud scales, but they're predominantly brown, whereas you can see here, slippery elm, the predominant color is black, although there may be a little bit of brown in there as well. Now, if you think you have a slippery elm, here's the good diagnostic feature. You take one of these live twigs down, it won't work with a dead twig, and you chew on it, or you pull off some of the bark, the inner bark, and you chew on that, 
And what you'll notice is in your mouth, it will immediately go to a real mucousy, snotty, thick, viscous texture. And that's why the species is called slippery elm. You know, the leaf is rough and sandpapery. That doesn't make sense, right? But it's that inner bark on the twigs and even the bark itself. Here you see a small tree that a squirrel has been chewing on, probably for those same properties. People used to use the bark of slippery elm uh, for coughs, colds, things of that nature, sort of a, a lozenge type product. The bark on slippery elm on a slightly larger tree, here one three or four inches in diameter, is very similar to the other elms, where you can see that white corky material in there that often has half circular endings to the ridges which is a great elm feature and helps you tell elms apart from similar looking sweet gum or maybe even a few of the oaks like post oak. When it gets larger, again, you see those same platy features on slippery elm bark. Slippery elm is probably not the best elm from a timber standpoint. It's one of the soft elms, so its wood isn't as high quality as American elm would be. Uh, slippery elm is, as we've seen, browsed by wildlife the bark is chewed on by wildlife so it does have some wildlife value even though it's not really a mass producer the seeds are so, small little samaras smaller than a dime that are wind dispersed um, it's a native tree it can live in excess of 200 years and it can reach heights on really good soils of 130 feet or more so it can be a large elm it has been knocked back throughout much of its range by dutch elm disease although that has not completely extirpated it anywhere within its range. Our last four species of this lab are all in the grape family, the Vitaceae. Two of them will be grape vines, two of them are other related vines. This is pepper vine, Vitaceae necomias arborea. It used to be Ampelopsis arborea, so if you see it by that name in a book, it's the same species. The taxonomy has just been updated. Pepper vine is a common native vine. It ends up being a little bit bushy. It can grow up to about 35 feet in height. And generally, people don't cultivate this. It's just a, a common native species. The best way to identify pepper vine is going to be the leaf, as you see here. It is a very dark green with a reddish rachis and petiole. Uh, but maybe perhaps on this photo, I can show you a little bit more clearly. What we're looking at is one leaf. So pepper vine is tripinately compound, where the leaflets are split up into more leaflets, which are split up into yet more leaflets. So it's three times divided. So these broad, triangular, tripinately compound, alternately arranged leaves are a great identification feature. Far enough south, it may be evergreen. In Central East Texas, it tends to be deciduous, so you're not going to have the leaves in winter. The most common mistakes I see in terms of identification on pepper vine are, one, people will look at it and mistake it for trumpet creeper because it appears, if you're just looking at part of the leaf, it appears that it has opposite pinnately compound leaves like trumpet creeper does. However, you should know trumpet creeper generally has yellowish green leaves, whereas pepper vine has very dark green leaves. Leaf off, it's going to be very difficult to tell pepper vine apart from summer grape that we'll go over in a moment. Uh, when you just have the stem and the tendrils, they look very similar to one another. The other thing I'll see people misidentify pepper vine for is going to be chinaberry tree. Because chinaberry tree has deep, dark green leaves with triangular leaflets, it is also tripinately compound. The leaves are similar in size. The main distinction, of course, there is that pepper vine is a vine and chinaberry tree is a tree, as is included in both of their common names. Beyond the leaves, you can use the berries. Many members of the Vitaceae or grape family have true berries, which means seeds are loosely distributed throughout the fleshy fruit. And this is what gives pepper vine its name. So these pink ones you see in this photo are not edible yet. The darker colored ones are edible. And if we look at some of them up closer, you can see they're very shiny when they're ripe, almost black in color. And if you pick that up and uh, eat it, it is edible. Uh, it's going to be like eating a grape, except it has this real spicy, peppery, almost sort of burn the back of your throat aftertaste. So most people don't like eating pepper vine. It's kind of neat to eat one or two, uh, but you don't see people out picking pepper vines by the bushel or anything to make into pies, anything like that. Here's the stem on a pepper vine. Uh, it'll be a woody vine. It can get up to, I've seen about an inch in diameter. 
Off the top of this photo, you actually see uh, the petiole of a leaf, where it's swollen, where it joins the vine, and to the left is a tendril extending. I don't have a photo of it, but the tendrils on pepper vine will fork at the end. They'll be split like a snake's tongue. And so that can be one more thing to identify this, although leaf on, there's no way you're confusing this with the grape vines, typically. Here's the form on a pepper vine that's growing on the ground, almost like an herbaceous plant. It can sprawl on the ground to some extent, and again, it'll grow up on other vines, on shrubs. You'll see it a lot on edges where you have a lot of Chinese privet, for example, growing on that. And it can grow, you know, 35, 40 feet up into a tree. So pepper vine is a common native vine. Its true berries are consumed by wildlife, so it has wildlife value, and it's on many of our sites in the southern United States. Hello, I am Bonnie Stovall, and I swear it's just COVID-19 that's trapping in my house and no other reason. I'm here to talk to you still about more tree art. Sometimes it can come in an accessory like a bowl. It doesn't just have to hang on the wall. Here is a bowl with leaves surrounding it. Some are blue, some are green. Still delicious to eat off of. Thank you. Virginia creeper is another high climbing vine in the Vitaceae family. Its scientific name is Vitaceae parthenocissus quincifolia. Quinca means five, folia means leaves, and we'll get to why that's its specific epithet in a moment. Uh, Virginia creeper is native across the south, and it's commonly cultivated. People like it for fall color, uh, as a ground cover, or growing up a trellis or any other structure. When you look at the leaves of Virginia creeper, you'll notice that there are five leaflets on this palmately compound leaf. That's why it's quincifolia. And so that makes it very easy to identify. People sometimes confuse this vine with poison ivy. So you may have heard leaves of three, let it be. Well, for Virginia creeper, you could say leaves of five, let it thrive. So it grows as a high climbing vine. Sometimes you'll just see a few leaves sticking out of the ground like this. And it, you know, looks like a small herbaceous plant. Sometimes it'll grow just a little bit. Here's an example of it on a pine where it's just starting to grow up the tree, although it could grow even higher up the tree. It'll start growing with tendrils that will attach to bark or to rock or really anything. And as the tendrils end up growing, they end up looking just like the aerial roots that you see on poison ivy. So this is why it's so easy to confuse with poison ivy. The distinction is, and this is a pretty fine distinction, the aerial root-like structures on Virginia creeper are thick, like someone took yarn and dipped it in wax. On poison ivy, they're thin. They look like steel wool or like hair. And so if it's got a really thick aerial root on it, it's Virginia creeper, very thin or hair-like, it's going to be poison ivy. Usually in the winter when this is leaf off because it is deciduous, before I'm willing to touch the vine, I want to make sure commonly by finding a twig. And so most people don't think about twigs on vines, but vines do have twigs. You'll look up and down the tree that this Virginia creeper is stuck to. You find the twig. And when I see that triangular, small, inconspicuous terminal bud and these large, circular, sunken leaf scars, that tells me that I definitely have a Virginia creeper and I don't have to worry about touching poison ivy. If this were a poison ivy, remember poison ivy has tan to yellowish, naked terminal buds. It looks nothing like this triangular, scaled, in, inconspicuous terminal bud. Here's another example of the twig where you can see the tendrils that are going to adhere there and again, imbricate scales on a small triangular terminal bud. Virginia creeper does have uh, fruits. You see the berries here. Uh, these are a little bit toxic to people, so you probably do not want to be eating these. Many wildlife will consume them, so it does have wildlife value as a soft mass producer. You can see the leaf in the background behind the fruits there. Sometimes a leaflet or two will get torn off them, and then they really look like poison ivy. But remember, poison ivy has small buttermilk-colored capsules, so there's no way you confuse the fruit of these two species with one another. Uh, beyond the, the berries being a little bit toxic, there are chemicals on the vine itself that can cause a minor irritation in some people, but nothing to the extent of the rash you would pick up with poison ivy. So Virginia creeper is native, common across the south. 
Uh, there's even a hiking and biking trail named for it near Abingdon, Virginia, the Virginia Creeper Trail. Uh, and it's a pretty popular ornamental species. We'll learn two grapevines in this lab. The first is summer grape, Vitaceae vitis estivalis. Estivalis means summer, referring as well as the common name to them fruiting in the summer. The most common spelling mistake I'll see is with the genus of the grapes. There is no us in vitis, just an I. Two, actually. So make sure you spell vitis, V-I-T-I-S, not V-I-T-U-S. Summer grape is a high-climbing native vine, broadly distributed across the southern United States. It is easily identifiable by the leaf, and it is discernible from our next grapevine, muscadine, vitis rotundifolia, in that the leaves have what we call rugose venation. The veins are sunken down into the surface of the leaf, as you see here, forming canyon-like structures. These leaves are also variable in their lobing. You see the prominent terminal lobe here, apical lobe, if you will. And the leaves are just variable in both size, lobing, and to some extent venation. Whereas muscadine has a much more consistently round leaf of all about the same size. Here you get a sum of the sense for the variability in the size and lobing on summer grape leaves. All the grapevines uh, can actually grow quite large, and you can actually identify them from the bark on the vine. When they're about an inch diameter, as you see here, the bark will be brown to reddish brown, very stringy, peely, shreddy on these grapevines. Nothing wrong with the vine, that's just what it looks like. I've seen summer grapevines probably three to five inches in diameter. They can really get large enough, you'd almost think it's a tree until you look closely and the bark gets rough and dark chocolatey brown when they get to that size. The grapevines grow and attach to things with tendrils, and so they hang on up in the canopy with a tendril. So grapevines the kind of vine you could grab onto and swing if the base was cut, but remember if you come back and do that in the next year, you just killed the vines, so you're probably gonna end up falling. The key diagnostic feature here is that the ends of the tendrils are forked, as you see in this dead, dry, woody tendril right here. Here you see an actively growing tendril, and again, the same thing. It is forked into two at the end like a snake's tongue. Muscadine grape that we'll learn in a minute, it does not have forked tendrils, it, it has just single tendrils. So that's a great way to tell these two species apart leaf off. They are both deciduous, and honestly, that's about the only way to tell these two apart leaf off. Here are the grapes on summer grape. Uh, as with summer grape, muscadine, many of our native grapes, people will take these and just eat them. Uh, they may be a little tangier than the grapes that you would buy in a grocery store. Uh, they also have a naturally occurring yeast on the surface, or number of different yeasts, as do any fruiting trees. And so if you crush these up, uh, you can make them into wine. Uh, it'll be a little tangier probably unless you go with a store-bought yeast that you would use uh, for venting. So summer grape is native, summer grape is common, you see it all over the place, as in this photo here. It can completely cover the canopy of a tree. You'll see them in openings, gaps, clear cuts, becoming very aggressive vines to the point sometimes they can hinder it when you're trying to get planted seedlings to survive. Uh, Escort, the active ingredient is mess sulfuron, is one common herbicide applied in areas where grape vines have become problematic. Our final species in this lab is muscadine grape, commonly just called muscadine. Its scientific name is Vitaceae vitis rotundifolia. Rotundifolia is referring to the round leaves. And much of what we just went over for summer grape will be very similar with muscadine grape. Uh, people really love to eat these grapes, make wine out of them. In fact, muscadine is even more popular. Muscadine has uh, been cultivated into several different varieties. People will graft European grapes to the rootstocks of muscadine grape as it's resistant to many diseases that both uh, European grapes and other American grapevines can be susceptible to. And uh, the fruit, I mean, you can go online and you can buy muscadine fruit where people have been picking it or even growing them in vineyards. So muscadine is an extremely popular grapevine, but it's also native and it's also commonly found out in the woods anywhere from Missouri to Delaware on south to Texas and Florida. In terms of identification, again, very similar to summer grape, except that these leaves are very round, not as noticeably lobed. 
They're kind of a shinier, darker green color on top, and they're much more consistent in terms of size, typically two and a half to five inches in size. Here you see a number of different leaves of muscadine, and again, they're all very similar to one another. So that usually is a good way to identify them. They get big. I've seen muscadine grapes in the six to eight inch diameter range, so they can get absolutely enormous. They can grow 100 feet up into a mature tree, so they're only limited really by the height of the trees that they have to grow on. So it's a very large vine. This bark, again, is this sort of deep, rich, uh, mahogany brown color, typically, and if you cut into them with a knife underneath the, the layer of dead cells on top there, dead cork cells, it's even darker color underneath usually. As with other grapevines, muscadine is going to grow with tendrils, and you can see in this photo here that the tendrils in muscadine, unlike many of the other grapes, including summer grape, remain unforked. Muscadine will cover everything, as we talked about with summer grape. It can grow in clear cuts, openings, gaps, really cover the ground, really become a problem if you're trying to get seedlings to establish. And as we discussed with um, summer grape, they have high wildlife value. Here you see one growing way up into a tree. It'll mast, it'll produce grapes up there, and you know animals like squirrels love trees that have grapevines in them because they're a great soft mast. That being said, muscadine is a dioecious species, so if this were a male vine, you're not going to get any fruit off it. Hello, I'm Bonnie Stovall. Thank you for listening to our installments about tree art around the home. If you are a significant other, a spouse, boyfriend, or girlfriend of a student or professor of dendrology, I understand it can get difficult to listen to all that jibber-jabber Latin names, and I offer you a solution. Earplugs. Please just put these in, hang up some tree art to appease them, and ignore them. Thank you, and have a great day. This is your last warning. Don't let them watch any more videos or you two will never be able to go on a nature walk or to a park or to walk down the road without hearing Latin names of trees. I'm telling you, this is your last warning. Get out while you can. Honey, the dogs need a walk. No, no more trees. Dad, stop taking pictures of those trees. Bad, bad, bad.